Look at the person next to you, and away we go. We're gonna uh, we, we're gonna start some start our time together this morning with uh, some controversy. This is actually not the controversial part, uh, but ladies, 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 I want you to know that the major theme of our uh, retreat for the guys was how do you win in the kingdom of God? What does it look like to win in the kingdom of God? Now that was the published theme of our weekend, how do you win in the kingdom of God? The subversive kind of underlying, if we branded the retreat with this word that I'm about to tell you, none of the men would come. So we did not brand the retreat with this word. We branded the retreat with this is how you win in the kingdom of God. And what we did when all of the men came to learn how to win in the kingdom of God is we sucker punched them and told them the way that you win in the kingdom of God is by relaxing back into intimacy. Your men spent a day and a half with a bunch of other men blowing up stuff and learning about intimacy. Now, if you branded a men's retreat with a weekend of intimacy, no dudes are going to show up. But if you brand the retreat with war and bombs and, and blowing up stuff and clay shoots, all the men come. And then when you get them there, we have a captive audience and you say intimacy and they can't go anywhere and you watch them squirm and I laugh and we have a lot of fun and it's a beautiful deal. So we targeted intimacy in all sorts of different ways and manifestations and whatever. And what we talked about last night was spiritual warfare, the real work of Satan in life to target intimacy. Satan's goal in our life is to destroy intimacy. Intimacy with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Intimacy with ourselves. Intimacy with our spouses. Intimacy in our family lines. Intimacy with our kiddos. Intimacy, intimacy, intimacy is the goal and the target of the enemy. And when we open up to that and understand that that's his target, then it becomes much easier to see who he is and what he's trying to do in our lives. So spiritual warfare is incredibly real in our lives. It is very, very difficult, if not impossible, to rightly interpret interpret the circumstances of your life apart from spiritual warfare. If we don't put Satan into the playing field of our lives and the narrative of our autobiographies, we are woefully ill-equipped to rightly understand the trajectory of our lives. According to the Lord Jesus Christ and every New Testament author, Satan is a viable enemy that effectually works in our lives to steal, kill, and destroy the very life that God our Father intends us to have. Amen? And so we have to grow up. We have to raise up. We have to sober up. We have to get out of the baby pool, take the spiritual floaties off, and engage in the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. That song we sung earlier about the war and the kingdom of God is powerful and it's true. And we really need to wise up in the reality of who our enemy is and how he works and how he comes after us so that we can fend off all of these attacks in the name of Jesus and live in the vitality of all that our Father has for us. We covered that last night in 40 minutes. No problem. Spiritual warriors in the room today. All the men say amen. amen. Yeah, man, we fired up and ready to go one-on-one, -on -one, man. All right, here we go. Now, let's start some controversy because we want to turn our attention from spiritual warfare to another enemy that may be equally as diabolical in our lives as Satan, equally as toxic, equally as poisonous to the rotting of our souls, that many of us don't understand, and yet many of us experience every single day of our lives. And that topic, that poison, is the poison of generational sin. So let's start some controversy, because I like to do controversial things. Those of you who are married here... How long in the dating process, how long uh, after you started dating or how long after you got married, did you experience the craziness of your in-laws? Why is the mother-in-law punching the husband? She's like, you better watch yourself right now, son. How long after you started dating your spouse or got married did you experience the insanity of your in-laws? So that's not controversial enough. So let's just keep pressing in. And by the way, I do marriage counseling, 150 bucks an hour. I'll fix all of this for you. First thing I'm going to do is get it all stirred up. I'm like the grandparent that sugar doses the grandkids and then leaves and you got to deal with it. I'm freaking stirring up your marriage. I'm sorry for your lunch, man, and not my problem, but I'm happy to help. 
So the first question is, how soon after you started dating did you experience the insanity of your in-laws? The second question is, how long did it take you, I'm sorry, to make the connection between the generational insanity of your in-laws and the behaviors of your spouse? This is the Bible, it's not me, man, I'm sorry. Here's the third question, because that's not enough. Here's the third question. How did the conversation go when you pointed out to your spouse that they act an awfully alike, uh, they act an awfully al alike their, their mom or their dad or their grandmother or their grandfather? How well did that conversation go over? Duck and cover. Some of you are in this room going, I'm not brave enough to have that conversation. And I say to you in the name of Jesus, that's why I'm here, to offer you an opportunity to be able to have that conversation. But what I want to say to you is this. I mean, that's, that's kind of, it's fun, but it's not fun because I say in the name of Jesus that generational issues are some of the most poisonous, toxic issues that rot our souls and negatively affect ourselves in every relationship that we have in our lives. And yet the vast majority of us have no clue or awareness of what generational issues are, how they work, and how we can get set free of them. We liken generational issues, discovering your own generational issues, to hearing your own accent. Who in the room has the thickest accent? You do? Why'd you raise your hand? Okay, this is, he was with us all weekend. That makes sense based on how much I know him. Uh, by the way, I was told to watch the drummer for, uh, during the worship time to get a full body. That brother, that's full contact worship going on back there in that worship set. That was fire. I was sweating watching you, dude. That was amazing. Here's a crazy thing about accents, right? You can't hear your own accent because it's the only thing that you've ever had. According to you, everyone else talks funny and you talk normal. This is the way it works with generational issues. The reason it's so hard to see your generational issues, brothers and sisters, is because it's all you've ever known. To you, they're normal. You would have no idea that your generational issues are actually issues. And the, the easiest way to discover your generational issues is to get married. Because your spouse experiences your generational issues, and for them, it is insanity. And then they go through the wonderful exercise of pointing it out to you, and of course, you receive it just wonderfully and warmly. Babe, thanks for pointing that out to me. I never realized that my mom was psycho. This is incredible. And now you're telling me that I have some of her same tendencies? I love you. This is a marriage, 101, 201, 301. So many of us have experienced relational strife in this room, in this room, because of the existence and perseverance or prevalence of generational issues in our lives. We don't even know it. And so we want to understand these things. We're going to demystify these things. Last night, we equipped a whole bunch of spiritual warriors. This morning, you're going to walk out of here with the ability to help other people get set free of their generational issues. It's powerful. In Espanol, it's poderoso. Si, sí, claro, claro. All right. Go to the next one. Si, sí, claro. All right, no más. You have in your handout, you have the handout that I gave you. We're going to see six generations of a family line. This is the family line of Jesse. Jesse is the father of King David. We're going to see six generations. And what you're going to see in the beginning of this family line are no generational issues. You're going to see a generational issue enter in. You're going to see it walk down the generational line, and then you're going to see freedom happen from that generational sin. Amen? All right, so here we go. We got Jesse, and you can see where you can read his story. If you want to read all of this in the scriptures, I encourage you to do so. It's absolutely fantastic. His story is told in 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 11. According to the word of God, Jesse had one wife, and he had eight sons. The scripture does not give us any indication that Jesse wrestled with any kind of habitual sin. It doesn't mean that Jesse didn't sin. It means that there was no dominant or prevalent sin pattern in the life of Jesse, according to the word of God. So in the lineage of Jesse, Jesse's a good dude. He's a good dude. Jesse has a son, his, his uh, uh, last son, and his name is David, and we all know the story, and David becomes 
King David, the greatest king in the history of Israel, and, 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 and David uh, develops a problem that his dad did not have. David develops a sin issue of sexual immorality. So on your chart, in the bottom of the column under David, where it says sin issues, write sexual immorality. David had eight wives, 19 sons, and a whole bunch of other children by concubines. No sexual issue in the life of Jesse. Sin, sexual sin enters in in the person of David. Now, watch this. This is super, super important for every single one of us. David's son Solomon. David has a son. His name is Solomon. Solomon is raised in a house where sexual sin is normal. It is all Solomon knows. In fact, not only is sexual sin normal in the family of Solomon, sexual sin in the family of Solomon is celebrated. Because David, in the nation of Israel, is the man. And so David is walking around and messing all of his sexual sin, and everybody is celebrating David, and Solomon is raised in that house and experiences the normalcy of sexual sin. For Solomon, sexual sin is no big deal. What are you talking about? It's all I've ever known. Do you see that didn't exist in Jesse? It enters in through David. That was the access point. It's now been passed on to Solomon. Well, here's what happens oftentimes in generational sin. The generational sin that's passed from one generation to the next is then expanded to begin to include other types of habitual sin as well. Open your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 11. I know every single one of you this past week in your quiet time with the Lord were devoting yourself to the study of 1 Kings. Thank you for that. That's good. 1 Kings chapter number 11, we're going to get exposed to what Solomon does, what Solomon does with the sexual sin that he inherited from his father David. Watch what happens. 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning of verse 1. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite, that's all of them, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall you associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, uh, and his wives turned his heart away. Watch this verse 4. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David had been. For David went after, excuse me, for Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as his father David had done. Then Solomon built high places for Chemish, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrifice to their gods. So in your chart, you got David's sexual sin underneath Solomon. I'm going to put sexual sin, and then underneath sexual sin, I'm going to write idolatry. Idolatry. Do you see Jesse, no sin, sexual sin enters through David. Solomon is raised in a house where sexual sin is normal, and then that sexual sin expands in the, in the, in the lineage of Solomon to now include idolatry. Well, Solomon has a son whose name is Rehoboam. Rehoboam replaces Solomon on the throne of Israel. Rehoboam is raised in a house where sexual sin and idolatry are normal. He doesn't know any different. It's not pollution to him. It's mom and dad. And so Rehoboam is living all of that out. Rehoboam in his life has 18 wives and 60 concubines. So you got Jesse, one wife, eight sons. You got David, eight wives, 19 sons. You got Solomon with every woman in Israel. And all the surrounding, like all the other men are like, dude, can you save some for us? No, I'm taking them all. Solomon, Rehoboam, comes along, 18 wives, 
60 concubines. Then we get Abijam, raised in a house where sexual sin and idolatry is normal. Abijam has 14 wives, can't keep up with his dad. 14 wives and 22 sons, 16 daughters. Sin issues in the life of Abijam, sexual sin and idolatry. It's getting passed on one generation at a time. One generation at a time. Until we get to Asa. God our Father gave Asa, gave Asa the opportunity to fight generational fights in his life so that the offspring of Asa would not have to fight those fights anymore. Asa becomes the one in his family line that says, no more. No more. Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings 15, beginning in verse 8. We're going to experience the liberating work that Asa went through to get set free from his generational line. We're going to identify three things that Asa did, and we're going to consider those for ourselves, for ourselves as well. 1 Kings chapter 15, beginning in verse 8. The scripture says, And Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son became king in his place. So in the 20th year of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, Asa began to reign as king of Judah. Pause there for a second. You know, the kingdom of Israel used to be united as one nation underneath the wonderful leadership of Rehoboam. The nation of Israel separates into two. The northern kingdom maintains the name Israel. The southern kingdom takes on the name Judah. So we have Jeroboam, who is now the king of the northern tribe of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. And now we got this guy named Asa, who is the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Verse 10, Asa reigned 40 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Mekah, the daughter of Abishalom. Now, pause. In the Hebrew, there is no difference between the word mother and grandmother. You have to use context to understand if it's actually the biological mom or if we're talking about grandma. Contextually, and I can show you this later if you're all that interested in it, this is actually Asa's grandmother. Maica is Asa's grandmother. That's going to be massively important as we move forward. So let me reread verse 10 in light of that. He reigned, Asa reigned 41 years in Jerusalem, and his grandmother's name was Maica, the daughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. He also put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols which his fathers had made. Verse 13. He also removed Mekah, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made a horrid image as an Asherah and Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. He brought into the house of the Lord the dedicated things of, the father, of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold utensils. Three things Asa did, three things Asa did to experience generational freedom in his life. Number one, he embraced his identity in the Lord. He embraced his identity in the Lord. I don't know what my, what my generational line is sending to me or not, but I'm going to use the Lord and his work and his word in my life as a filter, as a filter for what I'm going to accept as normal. And if there's anything in my generational line that's contrary to the word of God, I'm going to reject it even if it's coming in my generational line. The first thing is he does is he embraces the Lord as the standard for his life. The second thing is he, do, he does is he identifies generational issues and their sources. This is brutal. Not only does Asa identify the generational behavior or the generational lie, he identifies the person in his, the person in his generational line who is exercising authority over his family to maintain that generational sin in the family line. And in the life of Asa, that person who was controlling and manipulating and keeping the family in bondage was grandma. When I teach this in Latin America, (laughs) 
And all my Latino, uh, Latino brothers and sisters in the house said, amen, man. You, you flew me in from Houston to Nicaragua to rain on grandma? Good luck getting home, brother. I didn't write it. Uh, this the Holy Spirit. Don't blame me. But the scripture is super duper clear, brothers and sisters, that in the lineage of Asa, if Asa did not remove his grandmother from the seat of power in his life, he would have continued to suffer the generational issues of his family line. Look at verse 13 again. Asa also removed grandma from being queen mother. As queen mother, as that position of power in the lineage of Asa, she still had the authority to exert influence in his life and in his family line. He had to identify what it was that she was doing. And the very next part of Scripture says, because she had made a horrid image as an Asherah, and Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it. He identified who it was. It was grandma, and he identified the lie or the behavior pattern that grandma was propagating in his family line. He himself repented of ever participating in that behavior pattern because although it is generational, he is still a holy, responsible individual. So although I got it from my mom or I got it from my dad, I am still responsible for the degree to which I have chosen to give myself to this behavior pattern. So while my mom or dad may be the source or my grandmother or grandfather may be the source and I need to deal with those relationships and I will deal with those relationships, none of that removes my personal responsibility for the way in which I have allowed that behavior pattern to affect me change who I am, and then through me, continue the generational tornado of destroying relationships. I may have gotten it from my mom, I may have gotten it from my dad, but that relational destruction is on me. And so Asa says, I got to identify the behavior pattern, I got to identify the source, I got to dethrone Remove that person from the throne of my life. I've got to cut out that lie, and then I have to replace it. I've got to repent, and then I've got to replace it with the truth of what God our Father has for us in our lives. It's not enough just to cut it out. It's got to be backfilled with the healing and the love and the life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, by far, I help people get set free from demonization. I do deliverance work, and I go into dark places, and we talk to demons, and we do all that stuff. We do all that stuff. It is harder. My brother warned me about falling off the stage, and I almost just fell off the stage. It is harder. Oftentimes, it is harder and oftentimes more painful to lead people into generational freedom than it is to lead them into freedom from demonization. Generational bondage is, can be extremely difficult to overcome. Because that's my mom and dad. That's my grandma and grandpa. Now, some of you in here have moms and dads, uh, grandmas and grandparents that in totality have got to be cast out of the throne of your life. In totality. Others of you in here have a pretty good mom, pretty good dad. But that doesn't mean that everything that they gave you is generationally healthy. So a little bit later on in the book of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 27, we come across a king by the name of Jotham. Jotham is the son of another king named Uzziah. In the beginning of, of 2 Chronicles 27, 1 and 2, we discover that, Uzziah, that Jotham follows the ways of his dad Uzziah except in one area. There's one area of Uzziah's life, and it's the area of pride. And pride has a foothold in the life of Uzziah. Uzziah, generally speaking, is a fantastic king that did great work. He provided a great example to his son, Jotham. But in this one area, Jotham needed to contend with the generational sin of his dad. Otherwise, pride would have infected him, and he would have lived out that generational behavior pattern that he so easily observed from his dad. And so Jotham gives us an example where we don't have to completely dethrone mom and dad, but we do need to take a sober 
sober evaluation of exactly what I got from my mom and dad, and to the degree that I receive stuff that does not line up with the Word of God, I have a responsibility, not my spouse. I have a responsibility. This is my family line. It ain't her family line. It's not my wife's job to get me generationally free. It's my life. It's my family line. Now, she can help me and graciously, gently point those things out. Nevertheless, it's my family line. I need to contend with those things. And so we have an example in Jotham where he didn't have to completely eject dad, but I do have to filter it. I do need to see what's going on. But then we also have an example of Asa where grandmother had to get kicked out the house. And I'm saying, man, I've walked with a lot of people through this stuff where they had to cut mom and dad out or they had to cut out grandma. Those are extremely painful conversations. There ain't no way around it. There's no way around it. That is a very, very difficult conversation. And it's super helpful if you have a brother or sister in Christ who's really, really strong in the kingdom of God, knows about frontline stuff, walks in the power of the Holy Spirit to walk alongside you and love you and, and the guys, guys as well. Uh, 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 because it starts to feel really lonely. And, the, oh, man, when the parents start raising up, oh, my gosh, it can get ugly. All I say to you is this is your life. It's not your mom and dad's life. It's yours. And what God our Father has for you is far greater than whatever your mom and dad has for you. And I want to live in the fullness of what my father and, my, and, and, and what the Lord have for me. Amen? Amen? All right. So let me show you how this works in our lives today. we got the same three things. We got the same three things that Asa did, but we're going to well, we're going to amend them just a little bit. This is how generational freedom works in our lives. Number one, embrace your adoption. Embrace your adoption. If we limit the role of Jesus in our lives just to the forgiveness of our sins, I love Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. He died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. I'm grateful that He forgave me of my sins. Hallelujah! I'm singing all these songs. But we do not embrace the reality that in my salvation I have actually been adopted. For I was not saved just for my sins to be forgiven. That is a deadly half truth. I was not saved for my sins to be forgiven. I was not. I was saved for my sins to be forgiven so that. I could be adopted into the family of my heavenly father. Somebody say amen. amen. Salvation without adoption is powerless for generational issues and freedom in your life. Salvation without adoption is powerless to contend with the generational issues of your life. For in adoption, you are adopted out of one family line, one generational line. That generational line in the name of Jesus is broken. Because here's my generational line. Here I am. I got mom and dad behind me. I got grandma and grandpa behind them. I got great grandma, great grandpa. Here's all my generational line. Here I am. I'm living out my generational issues. Way up above is the lineage of Jesus. The lineage of Jesus. When I gave my life to Christ at 26, I was not raised in church, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Heard the voice of God in a bar. The Holy Spirit, whoosh. And man, I've been on a Holy Spirit rocket ship for 26 years. It's powerful, man. When I gave my life to Christ, literally, Jesus came into my family line, severed my generational issues, lifted me out of that family line and grafted me in to the family of my father. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, baby. Can I say come on, baby? Oh, I got the thumbs up from the pastor. Woo! Here we go. Lifted me out of my family line and put me into the family of God my father. Now, again, I was in my family for a long time. You were in your family for a long time. Your spouse was in their family for a long time. We just don't get set free of these things and magically, mystically put a little fairy dust on me and all my generational behavior patterns magically go away. That doesn't happen. What happens is that when we dethrone grandma and we recognize and repent of that, all of that is broken. As I learn to soak in the love of my father and the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, I have allowed the Spirit of God now to enter into the dark places of my generational behavior. As I soak in that, and the Holy Spirit begins to work in me in those very specific places, 
all of a sudden, transformation begins to supernaturally, powerfully, wonderfully, beautifully, gorgeously happen. Amen? So I have to embrace my adoption. And then just as Asa did, I've got to be able to acknowledge what are my generational issues and who are the generational power brokers in my life. And then I have to repent of those things and replace them with all that God our Father has for me of our lives. And so we say generational freedom is absolutely a gift of adoption. I don't know if y'all do this, what I'm about to do or not, but we've got time because I have no idea what time I'm supposed to stop. So I don't know if we have time or not, but we have time. Questions. Anybody, no comments, don't get up and start blah, blah, blahing or whatever. Because I'll, I'll, you know, anyway. Anybody have any questions about this particular? Pretty easy to see. Pretty easy to see. A lot of clarity right now in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is bringing clarity into your heart. You're starting to see as I go through this, as I go through this, nothing in Jesse. The sin issue in David's life is not generational, it's personal. It's personal in David's life. It becomes generational for Solomon, for Rehoboam, for Abijam. Asa becomes the generational breaker. You had your hand up, brother. Would you say that uh, boundary is a boundary that you're talking about like a relational boundary? Yes. Yeah. Dethroning grandma. It doesn't even feel good to say. <laughs> Dethroning grandma. Like all you white people when you're, hey, the, the black guy. Like, why'd you lower your voice? Like, dethroning grandma. Dethroning grandma. Like, it doesn't feel very good to say, okay? So in generational issues, again, if we can use the contrast of what Asa had to do versus what Jotham had to do, we understand that generational issues affect us in degrees, in degrees. For some of us, there's going to have to be this cutoff. For others of us who can still maintain a healthy relationship with a generational power broker, we will need to set up boundaries so that, that we're, we are no longer affected by that generational behavior that they are passing on to us. It's really hard to stop smoking if you go hang around secondhand smoke all the time. If you're trying to get sober, what are you doing hanging in a bar? If I'm trying to get free of generational issues, what am I doing continuing to hang out with the person that's just driving a stake in my heart again and again and again and again and again? Now, it could be that God our Father will for a season lead you to break from your family. Pause. For as long as the Holy Spirit wants you to pause, this is up to him and not up to me, and at some point in time in the future where I'm healthy enough now to re-engage with that family member, he may then reinsert me into the line of that family member, but that's up to him and it's not up to me. What does it look like? I'm on, I'm on, what'd you say? Uh, what is the difference? How do I kick grandma out and yet honor the Ten Commandments where it says to honor your mother and father? Here's the insanity of family life. Generational power brokers will bully family members under the guise of we're family. B blood is blood. You can, yeah, blood is blood because I got it dripping out of my arm and my heart. No, I'm not letting you do that to me. I refuse in the name of Jesus because I've embraced my adoption, I am far more a son of my heavenly father and a brother of Jesus and a temple of the Holy Spirit than I am your biological child. Far more. I used to be under you, uh -uh. not no more. So how do we honor our mother and father and yet get free from generational bondage? We do it in this way. When we break, when we break, we're not mean about it. You can break from your generational power brokers and you can do it in kindness. And that's how we honor our mother and fathers, and we also get free of generational sin in our lives. Cleto? Joel? How, how do we know uh, if, at what level of the extreme, I need to cut you out of my life, to I need boundaries, a little boundaries, a lot of boundaries, I need time versus permanent. How do we know with these relationships where on the spectrum yeah. does this happen and, and in what order? Yeah. Uh, ask your wife. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm, I, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. Like, they're really, truly, because, you know, the two shall become one flesh. We're supposed to be in this life together. Brothers and sisters, life is hard. Marriage is hard. Bombs are dropping, bullets are flying, body parts are everywhere. If we're not loving each other in grace and mercy and understanding, I got generational issues, you got generational issues. I'm coming to you from a place of empathy and sympathy to be able to talk and, and hopefully to get, come together in oneness and really provide as much as I can an objective assessment of what's going on in your family and how I see things. If we can't do that, then we got bigger issues that we need to deal with. So in all, in all seriousness, your spouse can be a very viable uh, uh, part, teammate, in helping you see those things. And then it's just going to become, again, a matter of establishing your adoption and the Word of God as the litmus test for what good godly behavior is. And to the degree that your, your, your uh, generational line is divergent from the Word of God, then I will know what, and to what degree I need to, I need to react. Amen. One more and then we'll be done. I have a question about this generational sin. Um, what if you're adopted and you don't know your bloodline? Yeah. 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 What if you are adopted and you don't know who your family line is? Again. I'm going to use the Word of God as my litmus test. And let me say, let me say two things, because you, uh, you, you, you put together a couple things that don't necessarily have to go together. We can suffer from generational sin just fine without any kind of demonic involvement. Generational sin does not require demonization. Now, demons can absolutely take advantage of generational vulnerabilities, 100%. But I don't want you to equivocate just because I have generational issues means I've also got demonic issues because you're just going to love me. He just came and said I'm demonized and all that mess, and I'm not doing that. So your generation can just be purely generational. Even if you're adopted, if you embrace the word of the living God as the standard for your life, you're going to be able to see, and God our Father knows who it is. And so you might not be able to name the person, but if you see this, this pattern in your life, maybe you've got siblings from other places, and even if you don't, if you don't know anybody from your family line at all, but you still have these issues in your life, you still have the opportunity to get free from every single one of those. And the adoptive force of the Lord Jesus Christ that has broken you out of whatever your family of origin story is, even, an, even a family of origin of neglect or abandonment, that's a family line. And the adoptive force, catch that phrase, the adoptive force of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than the destructive force of your generational line. Bow your heads and close your eyes. You say, whoa, that was abrupt. Chris is going to come up and, and play a little acoustic behind us because the Holy Spirit cannot move in what we're about to do without the Holy Spirit, without a, a guitar being strummed. I do know in the name of Jesus, uh, all kidding aside, that we have stirred some things up. And I, I want to say to you that God our Father loves you in ways that we cannot even, even fathom. My primary prayer is that through our time together today that you have actually encountered the presence of the creator of the universe. We can talk all this stuff all day long, but it is useless without intimacy and encounter with the creator who made you and the one who loves you. We do not have to flex ourselves into generational freedom. We do not have to strive into generational freedom, brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus. All we do is we relax back in. We relax back in to the current of the love of the one who adopted us. We relax back in to the current of the love of Jesus who paid the price of our adoption. And we relax back in to the current of the Holy Spirit whose waters will heal the driest, most bruised, most painful places of despair, in our lives, the spirit of the living God. We relax back in. We don't flex. We don't have to figure it out. We don't have to manufacture this. All of this has been done for us and blessed and given to us because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your responsibility today is just to accept the invitation from God our Father, from your Father, 
not from some kind of amorphous God blob, but from your dad in heaven. And your father says to you, my son, my daughter, I want to set you free. I know it's your mom. I know it's your dad. I know it's your grandmother. Son or daughter, I need you to know that I'm working in their lives as well. And I need you to know that I know what they did. But what you may not know is what your grandparents did to them or what your great-grandparents did to them or what your great-great-grandparents did to them. What was passed on to Asa, brothers and sisters, was four generations in the making. Do not be deceived. Do not minimize the generational violence that you have been born into. And do not minimize the power of the Holy Spirit to break you out of it. If you are here today in the name of Jesus and you would like to get set free of your generational sin, you know who the person is and you know what the lie is, and the Father has brought you to a decision point today, and you would like to get set free, you can simply pray and ask God our Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to be generationally set free today. Father, you know in my generational line that the generational power broker is my mom, my dad, my grandmother, my grandfather. Name that person right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know that this generational power broker has passed on to my generational line the sin of anger or the sin of fear or the sin of pride or the sin of control or the sin of despair or the sin of whatever it is. Name the lie. And then pray this, Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I renounce the authority of this power broker. I renounce the authority of my mom. I renounce the authority of my dad and the authority of Jesus Christ. I cut, I sever their authority in my life. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I repent and renounce the lies of my generational line. I surrender these things to you. Holy Father, I thank you that I am adopted into your blessed family. I thank you that by grace, you and the sweet sound of your voice have called me your son. You and the sweet sound of your voice have called me your daughter. You and the sweet sound and the power have anointed me and baptized me in the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And there is no family member, there is no family member who has the power to take that from me. I stand in the declarative force of the love of Jesus, for this is my life. And by grace, Father God, you have set me free. Lord God, I give you my life. I give you my generational line. I need you, Father. For those of you in this room, generational freedom happening all over this room. For those of you who have never given your life to Christ, man, you came into this place today. I don't know what I came here for, but man, God our Father has ordained this time for you to understand that there's a God in heaven who loves you and has life for you. And you have suffered in so many different areas of your life. And you have figured out that your way of life does not work. And you have been brought to this place today from the desert of your soul to repent of your sins, to be reconnected to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you could experience the life that God our Father intends you to have. If you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, we begin that journey by just saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, I have walked away from you and run away from you all these years of my life, and I'm asking you, Father, right now to forgive me of my sins. Father, I'm confessing that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I ask you, Father, to send your Spirit into my life and make me born again. Make me brand new. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, behold, all things old have passed, new things have come. God, our Father's leading you to say yes to Jesus. You pray that prayer. Father, I'm giving my heart to you right now in Jesus' name. As the band plays this song, man, let God, our Father, do business with you in the stillness of this moment. Father, you speak, you speak, and do what it is you need to do in Jesus' name.